All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Charlotte and I are both IPM advocates and provide our Water Our World services throughout the Bay Area. And we are really excited to talk to you about fall gardening essentials. And um, the, what we're going to do is we're going to go through slides for about an hour, maybe a little less, uh, but then we're gonna leave a lot of time afterwards, as much time as you need to answer all your questions. So if you have any questions, please um, go ahead and type them into the Q&A as they come up. We will be pausing in the middle of our program just to answer a couple of questions that will be relevant to the first half of our program. The first half of our program is really going to be addressing why the fall, right? Why moving into the fall season is the best time to add plants to the garden. And then the second half of the program is really looking at uh, preventing some of the common pests that uh, we see throughout the fall season. So uh, as questions come up, just go ahead and type them in to the Q&A. If you have any comments, you could uh, put them in the chat. However, questions really should just go in the Q&A and Charlotte will be assisting me and I'll be assisting her throughout the program. All righty. So our wonderful sponsor today is the uh, Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program that works to protect Alameda County's creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. So related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden and into the storm drain by the irrigation and rain, as well as mulch and other, uh, um, any type of debris, things like that. And if you'd like to learn or hear about new programs, free webinars, and other uh, fun activities going on throughout the county, please sign up to their newsletter. It's at the cleanwaterprogram.org. And uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, or for those of you that have been, uh, have joined other programs, if you're not aware, all of our programs, all of our webinars are recorded and they do uh, land on the YouTube channel, the Clean Water Program Alameda County YouTube channel. So have a look. Uh, there's quite a few programs now that you can refer to, that you can review and that you can uh, check out. It's pretty fun. And this program will also appear on this channel uh, probably in a few days, maybe Monday at the latest. All right, and uh, the Our Water, Our World program, for those of you that are not familiar with it, this is a program that was designed to bring uh, awareness between uh, pesticides and water quality with the intention of reducing the pesticide usage that harms water quality. We work with uh, retailers throughout the Bay Area and Northern California, actually all the way down to Central California. And we partner with water pollution prevention agencies. And we work with retailers to uh, guide them to less toxic uh, solutions and alternatives to toxic pesticides. We uh, recommend or suggest eco-friendly pesticides as alternatives. And we also provide each retailer with a rack of fact sheets, the picture on the left. And for fairly soon, you'll be seeing our QR codes that we are about to bring out into the stores to see if that's a nice alternative to taking the paper, which we've had a lot of requests about. And then you'll also notice those shelf talkers, the little blue tags that we will identify which products are going to be less toxic and not pose any harm to our waterways. All right, and uh, this is gonna be a little bit of review for people who've been here, um, uh, been to some uh, webinars before, but I'm gonna just review for everyone. So at Our Water World, what we teach is integrated pest management, IPM. And integrated pest management is, um, it's a decision-making process and it's a holistic view of uh, pest management. So, and it uses science-based strategies. So we try to look at the system, either the house or the garden or both as, a, as, it's, as an ecosystem. So the questions we ask, um, we wanna identify the problem 
Um, if maybe the problem isn't a pest, it's a nutrient issue or a watering issue. We really want to find it, figure out what is the problem at hand uh, before we take any action. Also, we want to ask, is this really a problem? So we see a bug crawling on a leaf. Um, maybe it's not a bad bug, or maybe it's not going to cause a lot of damage. So we really want to ask, like, you know, evaluate what damage is this causing? Can we live with it? If not, we're going to take some actions. And in IPM, um, some of the actions are called, or they're called controls, and there's four different categories. There's cultural controls, which is really about bolstering the health of the environment. So really focusing on the soil health, the watering, the overall plant health, choosing the right plants, because a healthy, um, healthy plants will be less attractive to pests and be able to fight off pest infestations if they do arrive. Then there's mechanical controls, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. Uh, these are the tools, the physical tools that we're gonna use um, in our homes and in the garden to manage pests. There's biological controls, which are using living organisms like ladybugs um, and other insects or um, uh, to manage pests and to also just understand the ecosystem that we're in. So um, other controls can be attracting um, hawks or uh, snakes and other birds that will keep pests uh, down as well. And then lastly, um, as a last resort, we want to use it as little as possible would be chemical controls, and these would be pesticides. And we're going to try to exhaust all the other options first before we resort to chemical controls. And we're going to use the least toxic as possible and as little as possible. And why um, we're talking about pesticides and water, um, I just want to uh, once again, paint the picture. Suzanne talked a little bit about this, but um, we live in a watershed. Everyone lives in a watershed. And in, uh, what a watershed is, is an area that drains into a single body of water. So watersheds can be massive and they can be quite small. Um, Alameda County is in the San Francisco Bay watershed. And that is a massive watershed. Half of all water that lands on the state of California, either in rain or snow, drains into the San Francisco Bay. And as it moves all the way from the mountains through uh, the valley and the, and the cities, it picks up debris, um, pet waste, pesticides, fertilizers, anything that we have out in the, in the yard, in the street, uh, motor oil, things like that. It's picking it up and it's um, all that water goes directly, when it goes down into that storm drain at the street level, it goes directly to a waterway. So, um, and it ultimately ends up in the bay and the ocean. So that's why we wanna talk about the little things we can do um, at our, in our homes, in our gardens to prevent um, putting more things out there that will end up in our waterways and using um, chemicals or otherwise that are gonna be less toxic to the waterways. So um, back to our gardens, we're gonna talk about how, why the next few months of the fall season are the best time to add plants to your garden. And there's several reasons why this is so. Um, the um, sadly, <laughs> sadly, yay, and <laughs> sadly for us, the, the days are getting shorter, but it's actually better for um, a lot of plants, especially when we're putting new plants in the ground. So we're talking about new plants. Um, the, the shorter daylight hours will be less stressful. It's also less hot during the day, less, um, less, stress, less, less hours of stress for new plants. The cooler evening temperatures will also be less stressful on the plants. And hopefully we're gonna approach or um, have a rainy season. Um, and having that rainy season is gonna allow for the soil to be, it's gonna be moist longer. There's gonna be water, more water in the soil longer, which would be available to the plants uh, continuously. So we have to worry about irrigation less and those plants will get continuous deep watering throughout the season. Again, fall, and also fall is uh, eight months or so from uh, the heat of the summer that we just passed. So uh, that stress that comes with the heat of the summer, those plants have eight months now to be prepared for that. Also 10 months till the driest um, parts of the summer, which is 
kind of right now, but um, if we're putting our plants in now or in the next month or so, we're gonna be careful to irrigate them carefully. And then by the time the next dry season comes, those plants are gonna be really ready for, for it. Um, so all of these uh, reasons are is why the fall is the best time to plant because it's really preparing your young uh, plants to really allow them to get established in the ground, focus on growing those root, roots without being stressed uh, by heat or light or lack of moisture. And just to clarify, we are still uh, able to get some triple digit days, especially out on the east side of the county. We are uh, due for, I think, a very some excessive heat over this weekend. But the idea is, is that those, though it still might get up into the triple digits, we are experiencing cooler evening temperatures and shorter daylight hours. So the days are cooling uh, sooner than they normally would. Thank you for that clarification. I live in San Francisco, so I forget that it gets really hot other places. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and then, so when you are choosing plants to install this fall, you want to, um, you might want to consider some California natives and Mediterranean plants because they're going to be the most suited to our summer dry climate. So we have milder winters and dry summers. So these plants are going to be more suited to that, able to withstand uh, that period of dryness and don't need that frost or the really cold temperatures. Also, um, really study your garden because different gardens, different yards have different um, conditions, windy, sunnier, uh, shadier, uh, lower, more moist. Um, you really want to study your garden and pick the plants that are going to be right for each part of your garden. And then you might want to also choose pest and disease resistant varieties. Your neighbors have, um, you know, ask your neighbors if they have a lot of problems with certain pests and disease, maybe at the um, at the nursery, you want to ask for resist if there are resistant varieties. And I do also want to mention that while you might get a California native or a drought tolerant plant, that doesn't mean that you can just put it in the ground and like just let it go. It might be super hardy and super easy to take care of, but that doesn't mean that you can just put it in the ground and ignore it. Drought tolerant plants um, very uh, hardy, you know, low low maintenance plants still do need attention when they're getting settled. And that's why we were talking about the low, um, the less sunlight and more moisture. We do wanna remember that for the first year or so, um, year or two of a plant's life, depending on the size of the plant, it does need more attention, more irrigation. So just remembering that, I've heard some stories of people forgetting to water their new plants. <laughs> And here's some resources for you uh, to find out what plants might work for you. The California Native Plant Society, the uh, BayAreaGardening.org is um, has great plant lists uh, for you know California natives, lawn replacement, pollinator gardens, things like that. And then the Alameda County Master Gardeners uh, website has great plant lists as well and can answer lots of questions for you. And as I shared at the very beginning of our program, I did send out a zip drive with these resources. Uh, however, for those of you that aren't able to open the zip drive, I will be sending these out uh, in the next email to all of you. So thank you for your patience with that. And then, um, as I mentioned, you do want to pay attention to your yard when you're adding new plants. So really study your yard. What are the microclimate? Even a yard can have different microclimates in it. So um, if there's a fence, if there's a tall tree, all of those things are gonna create um, a different environment. So you really wanna study it um, and think about how the plants might work in that space. How much space do you have? You don't, we might not wanna put a giant tree or a tree that's gonna get giant right in the middle of your yard if that's not what you're looking for. Um, topography is important. You, or if you're on a slope, uh, that's something to consider. And how do you want to, to, how do you intend to use the space? That's also important. Again, you might not want to put a giant tree in the middle of your yard if you want to use it for playing soccer with your kids um, or something like that. Um, and if you want to have a veggie garden, you might want to keep a extra sunny area clear for that. Uh, really think about how you want to use it. How much maintenance also do you want to put into your yard? 
Uh, you might not want to buy tons of plants that we're gonna need lots of pruning if you're not interested in, in doing that or you don't wanna hire someone to do that. And also another thing to consider when you are placing your plants in your yard, um, consider their needs. Um, as I mentioned, microclimates like sun, shade, wind, and heat, but also water needs. Your um, putting plants together with similar water needs is going to create much healthier and happier plants. Um, they're all gonna be getting the right amount of water and you, cause you don't want like a rose next to a succulent. One's get, they're, they're both gonna be unhappy or one's gonna be unhappy all the time. Um, and unhappy plants will lead to stressed plants, will lead to pest problems. So again, you keep your plants um, irrigated properly in the correct irrigation zones. You're, it's gonna make your life easier with irrigation and it's gonna make the plants happier and healthier. Um, and a way to help with the irrigation is irrigation systems. We've talked a lot about these irrigation systems, different kinds, um, especially drip irrigation. And I just wanna note that if you are interested in learning more about drip, we do have a past webinar um, focused on water-wise gardening and also drought, um, uh, taking care of your plants during drought, which will have more information on irrigation systems. But as we approach the cooler months and rainier months, it is time to adjust our controllers for the new season. Um, as Suzanne, or as we both said that the um, daylight hours are getting shorter and the nights are getting cooler, which means there's less evaporation. So uh, that soil is probably holding on to that water a little bit longer. So we might want to increase or decrease the frequency of our waterings. Uh, we still wanna water deeply. So we're not shortening the time that we're watering. We still wanna make sure that those roots, that water is going ni nice and deep, but we might um, extend the periods of time between waterings a couple of days. So it's best to, before your next watering, stick your finger in the ground, dig down, see if it's dried out. If it is, it's time to water. If not, maybe um, set your timer to uh, go on the next day or the day after that. And a reminder that um, these, these irrigation systems are fantastic because they can water for you at four in the morning and so you don't have to get up and do that. Um, it is the best time for between four and 6 a.m. is the best time to water for most, for greatest uh, conservation and efficiency. We wanna avoid evening waterings. Um, I know that some cities and counties are saying that 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. is a good time to water, but we really do wanna avoid evening waterings because when we water in the evening, we're, when the temperatures are cooler, we're gonna invite fungal diseases like black spot and rust. And we're also gonna invite uh, pests like snails, slugs, and earwigs. They like those cool, moist um, conditions. And then of course we wanna, um, it's not a set it and forget it system. We're gonna adjust for the season, but we're also gonna make sure we're inspecting for leaks. Um, critters tend to get into irrigation systems like um, and start chewing the hosing late in the season, like around now when there is very little water out for them. So they'll start chewing through uh, your hosing to get any water that they can. So making sure you're inspecting a system for leaks um, frequently. Because a, a broken or a missing sprinkler head could waste as much as 25,000 gallons of water, which equates to about $150 a month during the irrigation system. So um, really making sure that you're not leaking anywhere. And this, um, I'm actually gonna pause here because if you would like to write down the phone number or the email address for this um, department, you can find more questions on fixing leaks at the AC, um, the Alameda County Water District Conservation Department. Yeah, I have that resource on the, that, um, the Alameda County uh, Water District on the resource page. However, I don't have the, I didn't put the phone number or uh, the direct email for them, but yeah, great information on this website. Check it out. It'll be really helpful. Okay, 
Thanks, Charlotte. That was really great. So now let's start to think about planning for the rains. We can only hope that we get uh, a rainy winter. Uh, I'm sure hoping for a rainy winter, uh, but now is the time to plan, to capture as much water on site, to detain the rain, to slow the flow, to keep as much water on site, and actually to take advantage of the free water that is going to come in the form of rain. There are a lot of resources around the Bay Area for rain catchment. Um, I just wanted to share that when we receive one inch of rain uh, and rainfall over a thousand square foot surface, such as your roof or the roof of the garage, the house, a studio, you can capture over 600 gallons of water, which is significant. So even if we do have a very light rainy season, we can still take advantage of capturing the water so that we can then have water to later water our gardens with. So uh, that's something that I just wanted to share. Uh, there are a lot of different types of rain catchment systems out there. There's the um, uh, rain barrel, like the picture on the left, I think that's very common. We see a lot of those like in uh, our local hardware stores. However, if we go to an irrigation supply or farm supply, we're going to start to see uh, different types of rain catchment systems that are long and narrow. They're designed for the urban environment to go up along the side of a fence, the side of a house, and so forth. And I wanted to share, which I just discovered today, there are a number of awesome uh, free gardening we webinars that can really support you with uh, building your own laundry to landscape gray water system, uh, rainwater harvesting, that very class is happening on September 26th. You can get information on the Alameda County uh, Water District for rainwater harvesting and on the BASQA, the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency has a list of gardening classes every uh, spring season uh, and every fall season, they have a wonderful assortment, but already I see some excellent ones that would be really helpful for you in regards to conserving water, to keeping our gardens healthy, and by uh, looking at different ways to use recycled water as well as harvesting rainwater when the rainy season does show up. So check that out. And if you're looking to add some plants to your garden, you might also be looking at maybe uh, taking on a little garden project or maybe changing an area of their garden and really consider uh, installing a rain garden. It is not very complicated, but what it does is um, it's going to help divert any rainwater that might not infiltrate into your soil, that might run off into the storm drain. It's going to keep it on site. And typically the plants that we include in a rain garden are plants that thrive with winter rains and summer dry. So it's really cool. They're beautiful. Check it out. There's a lot of resources uh, that uh, share how to build a rain garden, large or small. And um, again, as I shared, I will send these uh, handouts to you after the program for those of you that are not able to see them just yet. And then just uh, to share, as we wrap up this section of our program is that again, on the Alameda County Water District website and as well as Basqua's website, there are some amazing rebates. So there is free money on the table to change out that controller for a smart controller, which is going to uh, be related with a weather station, which will automatically adjust the watering. So if you haven't changed it, it will reduce the frequency so that you don't have to water when it is not necessary. There's also great rebates on rain barrels so that you can capture that rainwater and then also lawn conversions. So this is the time, uh, please check it out. And I will share if it comes to lawn conversion, do not rip your lawn out yet until you filled out the application because oftentimes they want to see that uh, lawn area uh, so that they, you can qualify for the, um, the money per it's, uh, you know, certain dollars per square foot so that you can buy the plants that are on their plant list. So check that out. 
So we're gonna pause here just for a moment to answer a couple of questions in regards to um, planting this time of year or you know anything that has to do with um, rain and fall and water. Charlotte, did we have anything that came in yet? We had a few. Um, one person asked um, for a question about how long to run irrigation for a specific plant. And I just wanted to share that we've had those questions um, in the past. And um, unfortunately, Suzanne and I can't give you exact numbers. We wish we could, but every yard is different. Every situation is different. It depends on your soil. It depends on time of year. It depends on the type of plant. But there are some great starting resources. If you don't know how long to water, the, um, I believe East Bay Mud and the Alameda County Water District has some irrigation schedules to work off of. And then again, always observing, testing your soil before you water again. Um, that's gonna be as close as we can get. <laughs> yeah, because we don't know how long the plant has been established in your garden. We don't know about the different microclimates that your garden has. And we also don't know um, what is the plant. And so when you understand what the plant is and how deep and large the root system should become and uh, is it a no water once established? Is it a low water once established? Um, these are all things to keep in mind. And you can certainly get more information at the Sunset Western Garden Book, your local garden center, and as well, check out those uh, irrigation schedules that are on our local websites. And again, they are a starting point. You will have to observe and adjust accordingly. So thank you for asking that question. And then we had a, um, someone's requesting that you repeat the info about rebates for taking out lawns. And if you have suggestions for ground covers that would be drought tolerant in the Bay Area? Um, there, you can get information on the rebates at these websites and they go into a lot of detail about how to go about that um, the application process. And they will also have plants, a plant list of suggestions specifically on the BASCO website. Um, Charlotte mentioned it a couple slides back. It was the um, bayareagardening.org website, which is also, um, that's their plant list. Uh, that's the direct link to the plant list, although you can find it if you go to basca.org. So uh, there'll be a, 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 a very extensive list of plants that can be nice alternatives that are gonna be low water. And off the top of my head, it would be tough. I could say there's some sedges, there's some um, ground covers like thyme, but uh, depending if it's an area where you wanna walk on it, or if it's an area that you just wanna look at, um, it's hard for me to, cause there's so, many, um, there's so many options, believe it or not. So those websites will give you a really great uh, place to start, they'll point you in the right direction as well as the Alameda County Master Gardeners. They have an amazing plant list for uh, water wise and water saving plants. So check that out. And I think that'll um, point you in the right direction. Um, I think we're we going to, I move? think we're to move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the second half of our program, thank you for those questions, keep them coming. The second half of our program, we're really going to be talking about uh, pest management, preventing seasonal pest problems, and kind of like I, uh, how to prepare our gardens really for the fall season. Uh, it's going to be a little bit light. These are, of course, all uh, concepts and subjects that we could spend all day talking about. So these are just little tidbits to uh, remind all of us what we should be doing now and what to be looking forward to. So um, what does fall pest prevention look like? So when we move into the fall, what we start to see are uh, critters coming into the house or um, as Charlotte mentioned before, critters uh, in our gardens, chewing irrigation, tubing, because 
We are really at the end of the summer season. Things are hot and dry. Critters are looking for water. They might be also looking for food. So we have a tendency to see a lot more coming into our gardens as well as crawling insects and um, rodents trying to come into the house. So the best way or where we start is really to look at how we can prevent them from coming in by creating barriers and exclusion. Uh, we wanna also understand the seasonality of the life cycle of these pests, because like I said, I know that we're coming into this one season. I know it's very common that ants will start coming in the house. So let's just prepare for that. You know, they started coming in last year around this time. So I'm already prepared. I already have my ant bait stations or I've already sealed off the holes where they're coming in last time. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to monitor and see if they found a new way to enter. We're going to adjust those irrigation systems to reduce the frequency if need be, because we want to not only save water by not watering when we don't need to, but oftentimes we want to avoid overwatering our plants because overwatered plants can actually become quite stressed and stressed plants are going to be more prone to uh, diseases and other pest problems. And then we want to fertilize for the winter, for the coming winter season. Typically around September, October might be our last fertilizing for the year. We want to look at fertilizers that are low in nitrogen, because remember nitrogen, the first number, the NPK, is actually going to be all that nice above ground growth. And we don't necessarily need to stimulate above ground growth. We really want to start to uh, focus on feeding for below ground growth, it, feeding those root systems and feeding the all around health of the plant. So we're gonna look at fertilizers that um, of course are organic and that have either uh, their all purpose, which will be fine, or they've got three numbers that are the same, like maybe four, 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 or maybe we're looking at um, fertilizers that have um, the N number, the nitrogen is low, but then the, the P and the K might be slightly higher. So that's something to keep in mind. Also for, uh, we're gonna look at selective pruning. So, and this is really important for uh, our citrus. So if our citrus had uh, was infected with citrus leaf miner and we'd like to prune our cit citrus now would be ideal because we've got about six weeks before the potential of a first frost coming on give or take where you are in the county. And so just keep that in mind that this is a great time to prune our citrus. And then the next thing to keep in mind is before we move into the winter, we're not talking about doing any of our winter pruning like on our deciduous fruit trees or our roses. However, if we've got any whips, any branches that really grew and there's maybe some threat of if a big wind event comes through that that branch can break, we certainly want to just trim it back. We don't have to be super precise, but just get our plants in positions where they're not going to maybe uh, take on any damage from a weather event. And then of course, when those plants do lose their leaves and we do go into our winter pruning season, we can then prune accordingly. And then Another important thing is as we are leaving uh, our summer season, although I'll say that my tomatoes and my summer squash and you know all of my summer veggies are still going strong, but I'm starting to see them get a little tired out. And I already know that I'm starting to shift towards getting my uh, cool season crops in. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I'm cleaning up any uh, food crops that maybe I don't want to harvest anymore, maybe I'm tired of, or maybe that I've just kind of petered out, or food that's on the ground that maybe has dropped from any fruit trees or nut trees, things like that. And then we want to also uh, look at slowing the flow, keeping the water on site, as we talked about before, do whatever we can to keep all that water on site, that precious, beautiful water. We want to avoid it getting into the storm drains because our gardens can benefit from that rain. And actually the storm drains will benefit from not having more water going into them when um, they can stay on site. If you're not planting a 
uh, winter cool season vegetable garden, then it is a great idea to plant some cover crops. You want to uh, make sure that we're protecting that soil through the uh, cool season. Uh, and uh, one of the easiest cover crops I love planting are fava beans because believe it or not, fava beans are going to grow with ease. They're going to give me food because I love those fava bean tips. I'm going to trim them off. I'm going to saute them with a little sesame oil and garlic. They're delicious, but then um, they're also going to add nitrogen to the soil for my uh, next season crops. And then we're going to take advantage of sheep mulching for weed prevention and for soil health. Maintenance around the garden could look like picking up food crops, fallen food crops, as I mentioned, uh, mainly because they attract pest problems like rodents, uh, yellow jackets, and other urban critters, um, skunks and raccoons, rats and mice. We want to remove any leaves that have fungal spores on them, such as black spot or rust, because these spores can actually overwinter in the soil and will bloom again next year when conditions are correct. When we have powdery mildew on our leaves, it's a little different. It actually thrives in hot, dry, that's why we're seeing a lot of powdery mildew right now. So what we can do with that is syringe those leaves with a spray bottle of water to wash those spores off. They actually break or pop when we add water to them. And the leaves that are severely covered with powdery mildew, let's also cut those off. The older leaves, oftentimes like on the summer squash, will get uh, covered with powdery mildew when the newer leaves won't. Let's cut those leaves off and get them into the green waste bin. And then, as I mentioned, selective pruning is going to be really nice to keep our plants healthy through weather events, fertilize with low nitrogen fertilizer, and work with cover crops to protect the soil. And we're not there yet, and we'll most likely have another program that talks more about the importance of working with dormant sprays for our fruit trees and roses. However, I'd just like to remind everybody that we are not so far away from the dormant spray season. So uh, Thanksgiving, it, around Thanksgiving is a good time to apply the first uh, application. Horticultural oil is going to kill overwintering bugs. So if you had, for instance, an apple tree that had excessive um, woolly apple aphid, great, uh, a great opportunity to spray uh, or apply an application of horticultural oil. Now, if your plants did not experience any excessive uh, insect problems, then you won't need to apply a horticultural oil. Copper fungicide is going to be excellent to kill any diseases, any uh, fungal and bacterial diseases. So we want to also decide, for instance, I typically will spray my um, apple trees because they get scab with a copper spray. However, uh, last year we didn't have a, a significant uh, problem with the apples, so I didn't spray. And this year we also did not have a significant problem, so I won't need to apply it. It's really just if we noticed the problems the, in the previous season, then we can take advantage of spraying during the winter months. And then we are going to look at different types of tools we can use to prevent the critters. So this is really going to be utilizing hardware cloth or that galvanized wire mesh that's going to prevent rodents from coming in the house, uh, a fresh bead of caulk around uh, the windows or floorboards will prevent crawling insects from coming in, weather stripping will do the same. It will prevent a lot of critters from coming in, uh, from ants and other insects from walking in. Of course, taking advantage of all the benefits of sheet mulching, which is actually just layering cardboard and putting no less than three inches of compost, compost and mulch or just mulch on top of that, but it has to be no less than three inches. And that's going to prevent a lot of weeds. It's also going to condition the soil. And then the simple act of putting screens on the windows will prevent flying insects from coming in. We get a lot of comments about people wondering how to prevent flying insects coming into their house. Well, 
a screen. It's easy as that. And then door sweeps. Uh, I was recently on a, uh, a uh, uh, symposium for the state of California and one of our educators for the state did a special, um, uh, he was researching uh, some cockroaches and uh, an area in Northern California. And the number one tool or the number one thing that prevented the cockroaches from coming in was a door sweep. So understand that these tools actually do so much more to preventing insect problems in the house. So, uh, and they're very easy and very cost-effective. So, so just keep that in mind. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how we can apply IPM or integrated pest management um, to a few common seasonal pest problems that we're seeing or we know that are just around the corner. So I will start by talking a little bit about ants. So ant solutions. So outdoors, ants, um, you know, they we're going to see them. They're, you know, common. They're cruising around. If we happen to have a potted plant that maybe uh, we don't have anything in it, but just some dirt, or maybe it's, we're, um, it's an, a raised bed or uh, an area of the garden that just doesn't get a lot of attention. And then we go, we plant something and then we water that area. We happen to notice this explosion of ants. Well, don't worry. Those ants, now that you're cultivating that area and we're going to be watering it um, regularly according to the plant's needs, those ants are gonna relocate. So really you don't have to panic. However, what we do know is that ants really love to farm the secretions that come from aphid scale and other pests. We call this honeydew. It's sticky. It falls oftentimes from the trees. Sometimes it gets on those cars. It's kind of gross. Uh, so that's an indicator that if we see ants trailing up a tree or trailing up a branch, oftentimes that's telling me that there's another pest problem. So I'm going to address that pest problem. If you've got aphids or scale, I'm going to take some action to uh, you know, eradicate those uh, aphids or take care of the scale insect. But what I can also do is I can prevent those ants from trailing up that tree by making a insect glue trap. It's a barrier. But uh, what it is, it's either tangle food or the sticky insect glue. And we can just strictly just simply make a barrier to prevent them from going up the tree. They kind of get stuck in it. It's no good. However, we never want to apply it directly to the plant tissue. We don't want to uh, apply it directly to the bark or the branch. So we're going to first put some type of a banding material. And that could be a piece of paper that's kind of coarse. It could be sticky, uh, it could be packing tape uh, or um, duct tape sticky side out. We just wanna put that really tight around the branch or the trunk, and then we'll put the glue or the tangle foot on it. And then there are some outdoor bait stations and other types of baits that have uh, the boric acid or the spinosad as an active ingredient, these are going to be less toxic. However, we do wanna be mindful that if we are putting these bait stations out, um, sadly from personal experience, I had an ant bait station stake outside. I didn't consider that the unintended consequences and an urban critter came and chewed it because the active ingredient uh, though it's very effective and less toxic, it is uh, mixed with a sugar bait as an attractant. So it attracted some urban critters. So now what I do is I just open up a gopher basket and I put the gopher basket over my ant bait station stakes for outside to prevent anybody else coming in, anything else coming in to chew on it. So we really want to try to uh, always consider any of the unintended consequences that could happen when we're using these types of products outside. And for inside, we are going to notice ants coming in. Well, let's just simply clean, uh, kill that scout, wipe them up and clean up that scent trail. That's all that's happening is ants are coming in looking to see if there is some yummy food or a water source that they can access. And then uh, when we can clean up that scent trail, the ants are going to, you know, have to create a new one. We also are going to seal up any cracks and crevices. As I mentioned with the fresh beat of caulk, we're going to apply new weather stripping to the doors and windows. 
accordingly. And then we can use these bait stations. Bait stations are a more efficient way to manage ants in the house. And it's because they can take the back the bait back to the colony, feed everybody, and then everybody it dies. However, again, we wanna make sure those bait stations are um, in a place that other uh, pets or children cannot access them. And then if you do want to use a spray, Orange Guard is going to be the least toxic, although it is just a contact kill. So we will kill what's coming in, but we will have to most likely um, apply that again when more ants come in. And then there are some products that we always like to remind you the difference of and how they work. It's boric acid and diatomaceous earth. These are both really fantastic for crawling insects. Boric acid though is going to be about the size of a grain of salt and it is ingested. It is intended to be ingested and how it works is that cockroaches and ants walk across it. They are grooming insects. So that's how they are ingesting it. You can also get the little boric acid um, Tablets by Harris, that's for cockroaches only. They'll feed off of it, and that's how they also will get it ingested. It disrupts the, um, the bacteria in their stomachs and prevents digestion. So, and then diatomaceous earth, which is a very fine powder, more like chalk, it actually gets on the exterior of that insect and it dehydrates them. So both really great, but both very different. All right, so I just want to give a little warning. Um, the next we're going to talk about rodents and how to reduce their population. So sometimes things we talk about can be a little um, uncomfortable. So if you're sensitive to that, I just want to give you the warning. Um, but rodents are a very common and significant problem. Um, more than a third of homeowners in, in the United States have seen a rodent in their home or garden in the last year. And this is um, for a lot of reasons, um, but the rodent populations can increase quite quickly. And there's not that many you know, natural predators out there because we live in homes and cities and things like that where um, uh, natural predators or rats aren't um, able to get to them and us humans are not as great as killing <laughs> or as get, getting rid of them, <laughs> reducing the populations as some other um, predators. So rodents, um, but they are important to get rid of. They are more than just a nuisance. Um, they can cause costly damage to your home and to vehicles. They carry fleas, ticks, mites, and they can transmit diseases like hantavirus and others and the plague. Um, and their waste is also a contaminant and can transmit disease as well. And a reminder that rats can chew through a lot, <laughs> a lot, steel wool, expanding foam, aluminum, concrete, drywall and plaster, rubber, plastic, and wood. It's a lot. So, and, but we, uh, let's remember that rats cannot chew through um, hardware cloth, which is the picture in the middle. Um, it's a galvanized wire fencing or mesh. And the preferred size for rats is quarter inch. So each hole is about a, qu is a quarter inch um, uh, big, <laughs> wide, I guess. And then, or sheet metal flashing, which is a solid uh, piece of uh, metal that can be used similarly over holes. And we want to use that quarter inch size because mice and young rats can fit through a hole three eighths of an inch, which is about the size of a pencil. So if you can stick a pencil through a hole, then a, rat, a mouse and a young rat can fit through it as well. And that quarter inch is going to be a little bit smaller than that three eighths inch. So that's what the size we want. And then here's just some examples of how we use those two products in the home. So covering vents um, and other um, holes that need to be there. Uh, we wanna cover them with the hardware cloth so that air can still flow through. And then um, here's an example of galvanized metal, these little corners that are that you can get at a hardware store. They're great for garage doors. Mice and rodents can tend, sometimes will chew through the corner of the doors to get in. Uh, there's lots of yummy things for them in garages and it's nice and warm, so they want to hide there, but these little um, corners are really helpful for keeping them out. 
and lots of ways uh, to keep my rats and mice out of the house. Um, again, the, keeping them out is going to be the long term solution. We'll talk about shorter term solutions like trapping in just a moment. But really, when you have a, a pest, an ant or a rodent or any kind of critter in the house, you want to ask why, how is it getting in? So we want to prevent them from coming in. Again, they fit through three eighths of an inch. Um, so we want to go for really, we're, we're looking, we're not looking for mouse holes, we're looking for tiny cracks and crevices now. So we're going to replace weather shipping on doors and garages. We're going to check the foundation and attic vents. We're going to check other vents like fireplace, stove, laundry dryer vents, and cover any um, cover them with quarter inch hardware cloth. We can use sheet metal flashing or hardware cloth with expandable foam to seal up uh, gaps, especially in like or yeah to seal up gaps. Um, we're going to caulk under sinks and patch holes in the walls. We are gonna place um, pet food, especially in metal containers, especially if that's where if you find them, where you ever you keep your pet food, that's what they're going for. So keep put it in a metal container that can close very tightly. Um, and all, all other food, keeping your, your um, pantry food in glass or metal containers is gonna keep um, rodents out of there as well. And then, um, mice like to nest um, in cardboard. So if you have storage areas like in your garage that don't contain food, but contain uh, like pillows or whatever, anything uh, that's not food, you wanna maybe consider putting those in a plastic bin rather than a cardboard box to avoid mice from nesting in them. And as I mentioned, traps are a very efficient uh, way to, a non-toxic way to get rid of rodents but they are not um, a long-term solution. So if you don't wanna trap every season, you're gonna to wanna to go for those, um, those, uh, those creating barriers. But traps are very effective, so, um, and they're relatively cheap. So some tips for working with them successfully. Um, if you have trouble, uh, so let me say, rats are very wary of new things in their environment. So sometimes when people put the traps out with bait and they're not having any luck, it's a little frustrating. A trick that we've learned recently is that you can put the trap out with bait on it, but don't set it. Really let that rat get used to it um, and used to it in its environment. And that'll make um, trapping it in a few days a lot easier. This is also a great way to figure out what the rat wants to eat and what bait to use. Um, because if you see it keep, uh, eating the doggy kibble off of the, the, the trap for a day or two, then you know that's going to be effective. The next day, you're going to set the trap and it will hopefully um, get that rodent. Also being creative with the bait. Uh, it's not just peanut butter. It's not just cheese. Cheese is actually not a great um, bait because it dries up and it, it's kind of, it's not very, it's actually not that smelly. So things like a Slim Jim or a chewy granola bar, a Fig Newton, I've heard Nutella is a good one. Um, doggy kibble or cat food, if they're already going for that, whatever they're already going for, use that as their bait. Um, walnuts and other nuts as well. Um, moving the trap every few days uh, is, is recommended if you're not having success. Although again, rats are very wary of new things. So if I've heard if you, when you're baiting the trap, try not to move it because they know, even if it's just been nudged just like half an inch, they know it's been, it's different. So, but try it in an area, if it's not working, try it in a new area in a few days. And then once you catch um, a rodent, you wanna get rid of it immediately, dispose of it in the sealed bag and put it in the garbage can. You wanna make sure it's sealed because we don't wanna be spreading diseases through the landfill and we don't wanna um, harm anyone who's taking our waste away. Some uh, suggestions for trap placement, more traps, the better. You're gonna have more success with more traps. Uh, you want them against, if, they're, if you see rats going along a wall, you wanna put the trap right up against the wall. Uh, remember, rats go where the, no, let me try that again. Put the traps where the rats are. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. If you see rats climbing along your fence, put the trap on the fence um, because they're never gonna, go to a baited trap. They're gonna kind of need to 
happen upon it where they are already going. So one trap is good against the wall, more better arranged against, against the wall as well. Um, try pre-baiting it without setting it. And then of course, check frequently once you um, set it to, so you wanna, cause you wanna remove that um, body as soon as possible. And then in the garden, um, similarly, we want to keep, um, we wanna remove ways that they, uh, places that rats and mice can hide um, or places of harborage. So where they wanna live and hide. So dense ivy, dense brush, um, clearing up any of that. Uh, we wanna also remove any food sources. And this is, um, there's a lot of food sources out there. So we wanna contain our compost bins uh, we can put, we can um, contain that with heart, quarter inch hardware cloth. We want to contain our chicken coops, um, keeping our lids on our garbage cans very securely. We want to uh, avoid feeding pets outside. And if you do only for a certain, for a short period of time and clean up after it, uh, we maybe consider removing your bird feeders because the, the, the mess that um, bird feeders can make uh, is very attractive to rats and mice and excluding them from um, our food gardens. We'll see a picture in just a second. And then I just wanted to say also that trimming trees away from your home and uh, from your roofs is going to prevent uh, rats from climbing um, from the trees to your house and keeping them out of your, your attics, for example. And then just a note on those exclusions, keeping them out of your veggie gardens, the best way to do it is through exclusion. So creating a barrier and exclusion cages can be small. Um, they can just go over one individual plant or they can be massive. You can walk into them um, like whole, you know, greenhouse size, it depends on your needs, but they can be customized for you. Um, and they're just, they, they are, have the quarter inch hardware cloth around with a frame and um, so it still allows sun and water to enter as well. An option for trapping outdoors um, is this uh, CO2 trap that's um, been relatively recently on the market. It's called Good Nature A24. Um, this would be probably recommended when you have, if you have a really bad rodent problem outside. Uh, definitely not recommended for inside. I personally wouldn't recommend it for inside, but for outdoors, um, especially if you have like a barn or some sort of uh, um, situation that is very attractive to rodents, this is good for that. Um, what happens is there's like a Nutella type chocolatey bait in the top. The rat goes up into it, smelling and licking for it. The CO2 trap, uh, the CO2 um, creates some sort, it either knocks it out somehow, throw the rat out somehow very quickly, kills the rat and the rat is then, it's not toxic, it's not poisoned, so it can be scavenged by another critter. And then I wanna to touch on rodents damage in cars because it's a really common question that we get. Um, to prevent, uh, we don't recommend putting repellents or anything, no sprays, no um, those little packs in or around your engine. Um, you wanna uh, just focus on where you're parking your car, um, especially if it's for a long period of time, you wanna park it with the air vents closed so they can't get into, uh, into the car. Um, and you want to really clear the area under and around the car. Uh, so you don't want any bushes nearby. You don't want dense brush underneath the car um, because all of those spaces rodents can hide and then they can easily get to your car. Rodents don't like to jump out into open spaces. So if there's an open space around your car, less likely to attract rodents. Um, there is some rodent tape that can be used to wrap wires in your car that um, has capsaicin in it that is repellent to rodents. Um, that is one of the reasons why rodents come into cars is to chew the, the wiring, um, the thing that goes over the wires, because it used, it's sometimes it's made out of soy material that apparently is very tasty to them. And then another, uh, moving your vehicle frequently or and banging on the vehicle to scare rodents away. All right. 
So I do apologize that we're going a little longer. I did not anticipate that. So my apologies, but I'm going to just briefly talk about uh, gophers and moles because this time of year, well, it's been a significant gopher and mole year, if you ask me, and we're only going to see more activity as we start to approach winter. And the difference here is going to be that gophers eat the root systems of plants. They are going to tunnel a little deeper, about six to 12 inches. Uh, they have extensive burrowing systems and their mounds are going to be look very different than moles. They're actually going to be a little bit more of a crescent shaped. Whereas moles, they're actually eating the bugs, the earthworms, the white grubs, the beetles and other soil dwelling insect larvae. They have shallow tunnels. You actually physically can see the tunnels that they're creating typically throughout a lawn. So they can really wreak some havoc on a, a beautiful lawn or in a garden area. And they also have very elaborate burrowing systems. Gophers, we are going to use some exclusion to prevent them. If we know we have gophers or we know our neighbors have gophers, we can assume they're going to come over to us. Everything gets planted in a gopher basket. I know it's an extra cost, but trust me, it is your insurance. And then we're going to line our raised beds with that half inch hardware cloth. It does not need to be quarter inch. It does not to be a, need to be as small as we would use for mice and rats, but half inch hardware cloth or proper gopher wire will be recommended. And working with traps is very effective. However, gophers are smart, so we have to be persistent and patient. There's a number of different types of traps on the market. You can become familiar with how to use them and what's your preference. But because the traps typically don't come with directions how to set them, the UCIPM has a YouTube channel. Please check it out because there's a lot of information there on how to place the uh, traps, how to find active uh, runs, and how to set a variety of different traps that are available on the market. And then what about the gassers and the baits? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, the gophers can uh, close off a tunneling system extremely fast. So if they sense any harm or danger, it is faster than a blink of an eye. And then the thing with the baits is that they are not a natural food source. What we find is that gophers will uh, try to push those baits out of the tunnel, which at that point exposes that bait to any other untended critters, including our pets or children to possibly have uh, come in contact with it and ingest it. So really wanna use traps because we know we have eliminated what we have eliminated. Moles. So here's a picture, it's not very easy to see, but you'll see the tunneling system is very surface and their mole mounds are very much uh, like volcanoes. They're very uh, um, for, uh, regularly shaped. I and a lot of my colleagues, we like to consider them beneficial because they're eating the larvae of pest insects that might cause further problems for me in my garden. Um, and they can be very effective at eating these insects. They can eat up to 100% of their weight in insects each day. So that's a lot of pests that they're eliminating from my garden. However, they can really do a number on the garden. In the lawn, typically what I do is I'll just rake that mound down and put some new lawn seed in it. Uh, and then, you know, that's how I manage it that way. But if we want to prevent the um, moles from coming in, making these problems, we want to remove the, the food source. How do we remove that food source? Well, we can do that with beneficial nematodes. Beneficial nematodes are microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally feed off of the same uh, soil dwelling insects that um, the moles do with the exception of the earthworms, but really great alternative way to manage these problems. For more information on the rats and mice or voles, moles and gophers, you could check out the fact sheets on the Our Water, Our World website. So now Charlotte's going to discuss some IPM for raccoons. Yes, and I apologize, late, we'll, we'll try to get through this and 
Suzanne and I are both answering people's questions as we go. So um, yes, raccoons and lots of other urban critters, mostly raccoons. So I don't know if, <laughs> if anyone saw this picture. It's kind of a frightening sight, a, crowd, a gang of, of uh, raccoons in Golden Gate Park. I've actually seen a similar sight in person because someone fed them um, pet food and I saw a whole crowd of them eating. It was pretty horrifying. Very common critters. So let's talk about getting, keeping them out of our gardens. So similar to rodents, um, we're gonna make sure that they can't come in with exclusion. So putting hardware cloth on attic vents and eaves of the roof, uh, keeping food sources away. So containing our garbage, green waste cans and our compost piles keeping the cats and dogs indoors at night. Um, they can, yeah, they can be a danger. They can be in danger of getting hurt by raccoons, especially if they're smaller animals. Um, and keeping that pest food, pet, sorry, <laughs> pet food inside. If you are feeding your cat, your animals outside, keep it out for only a short period of time and clean up afterwards. Um, they will come in to eat into your yard to eat that. Securing your chicken coops, the raccoons can get in there, eat the feed and the eggs. Um, again, securing your compost stations and compost bins, harvesting the food crops um, quickly. Also those exclusion cages that I showed um, are gonna keep raccoons out as well. And then cleaning up that fallen fruit from fruit trees as well. So I don't know if anyone else has seen this uh, rolled up sod or lawn could also be um, just holes in the lawn. This is likely raccoon damage and there's some ways that we can um, prevent this. So what's happening there is raccoons know that their they're, raccoons are really smart and they know that underneath that freshly laid sod there are, um, there's a nice layer of grubs and insects under there. So they just roll it up like a carpet and dig around and get what they need. Sometimes they, yeah, I don't know if they ever roll it back, but I've heard lots of stories of them rolling it up. So ways to prevent this is to keep that turf really healthy. That's gonna prevent um, lawn grubs and it's gonna grow those roots nice and deep so that they can't roll it up. Um, using exclusion when possible. So that with your lawn, that would mean making sure that freshly laid sod is staked down with irrigation um, stakes, or you can lay bird netting or poultry wire over the top of your uh, sod or your lawn and secure that down. That's gonna prevent the digging and the rolling because they are not gonna be able to physically dig in past that poultry wire. It's gonna, it's gonna definitely bother them and prevent them. That works for cats as well. Um, if you have cats, like a neighbor's cat gets into your garden, use it as a litter box, laying down either bird netting or, or a poultry wire on the surface of the soil or the mulch or wherever it's digging is gonna prevent that cat from coming back. Removing food sources and um, not feeding wildlife. Um, unfortunately, wildlife in our urban area has learned that we have a lot of food. We oh, sometimes we offer them food, and we don't want to do that. Um, so we basically trained animals to know that humans are a source of food, and also um, they know where to find raccoons. Especially, will know where to find grubs. They've been in a lawn before, or they've been in your lawn before. That where there were grubs, they're going to come back, whether you have them or not, to look for them. And on that note of feeding wildlife, I do want to remind everyone that it is illegal to feed wild animals. So um, that includes coyotes, raccoons, foxes, bears, mountain lions, bobcats, and opossums. Um, and that includes leaving your pet food outside. We do not want to leave the pet food outside to inadvertently feed the wild animals. And a way, uh, um, Suzanne already mentioned this, to get rid of grubs to prevent moles. So again, if you have raccoon issues where they're digging up uh, your lawn or rolling up your lawn, you can use beneficial nematodes to get rid of those grubs that they're going for. 
And trapping is um, an interesting um, conversation. Um, it's very tricky in California. So I do see traps for sale um, in stores, but in California, you cannot move wildlife. So if you do trap it on your property, you have to release it on your property. Uh, you also aren't able to uh, dispose of it in a certain way, or I don't know what the nice way to say it is. You can't, um, you can't kill that animal on site either. Um, so uh, you, trapping just doesn't really make sense. So, um, and then you can learn more about trapping laws at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, because again, they can be released on site or they must be euthanized humanely and that there are some definitions regarding what that means. Um, you can't suffocate or drown them and you can't use a firearm and you cannot relocate because relocating actually causes more problems and it actually is not very humane to move an animal away from its home into an unfamiliar um, place. And this is an excellent, I'm just, sorry, I mentioned that book is a very excellent resource for dealing with uh, wildlife in your pests, in your uh, gardens and homes. And some more resources for you, the Our Water, Our World website. I think I just shared, I shared one of the fact sheets in our chat recently about gophers and moles. So it has lots of fact sheets on there about, about 18 different um, pest problems and, and garden um, topics. Then there's the UCIPM website, which is a excellent, um, an excellent resource for, especially for identifying um, pests. It's, they have this really handy tool that can be used kind of as a, I say it's like a WebMD symptom tracker. You can um, use it to figure out what the heck is going on with your plant. Is it a fertilizer issue? Is it a water issue? Or is it a pest and figure out what that pest is. And there's also the bug guide and the National um, Pesticide um, Information Center as well. I just wanted sure. to add on the UCIPM website, they have a new feature, which is the wildlife identifier. So that will also really help you uh, in regards to that book that Charlotte just said, this is a great resource, but all of the information that's in this book, which is actually from uh, the UCIPM is now on their website. So check that out. And also um, some important, sometimes, you know, pest problems can't be dealt with just the homeowner. We can't do it on our own. We need a professional. So um, here are some resources for hiring a pest um, control company. You can always ask. It's always a good idea to ask for IPM services. There are certain companies that do offer that, and that will make sure that they are using least, the less toxic um, approaches to the pests that you might have. So it's the UCIPM note and the Our Water, Our World um, fact sheet. And that's uh, that's all for us. Sorry <laughs> well, about so we're going to stick around for. Oh my we're gosh. We're going to stick around for questions and so um, our contact information is there as well.